Well, today is April 3rd, and today we're going to talk about volatility suppression. There's been a lot of discussion recently about the effects of call overriding, is the VIX acting normally, zero DTEs and the like. And so we wanted to quantify some of the oddities in volatility and market movement, give an idea of how we think zero DTEs and call overriding are impacting markets, and then lastly, outline a couple of ways that we think a lot of these flows could unwind and what the ramifications of that uh, may be. So let's start with S&P 500 realized volatility. What you see here in green is what I want to bring your attention to. That is one month SPX realized volatility. And as you can see, it is at lows. You know, we scraped those in 2021. Broadly, you have to go back to 2019 to see these levels of realized volatility, which just tells us that the market is moving less now than it has over the last couple of years. Now, this is low, but it doesn't seem to be an aberration, a la something that you would see, let's say, in 2017. The VIX. Uh, in kind is low, but it doesn't seem to be anomalous. Here you can see what the average is. This is from the SIBO. And indeed, you know, we're, where we were pre-COVID crash doesn't appear to be anomalous, just kind of going about its business, so to speak. Uh, this chart here is a concept put forth by Yuan Sinclair in some of his great books. And what you can see here is that we have uh, the VIX versus one month SPX volatility. And so the spread between those two is average. Uh, and that's the average here is the red line. Now, there are times where that premium, the VIX can increase if people are scared about what's about to happen in markets, uh, or that premium could shrink or actually go negative. For example, excuse me, after the COVID crash, uh, realized volatility is very high, but the feds come out and say, hey, we got your back. And so uh, implied volatility collapses and the VIX drops very sharply. So again, this tells us that the VIX is kind of behaving normally, so to speak. I want to talk because a lot of discussion is around, well, zero DTEs is driving VIX lower and VIX doesn't matter anymore. And so the VIX, uh, the CBO has the VIX nine day. This measures the volatility, uh, implied volatility, basically the S&P over the next nine days instead of 30 days, which the VIX is. There's two interesting things here. Number one, this is at lows, again, not seen since 2019 or at least pre-COVID. The second one is there's less tails in this data points. So if you look at it from the candlestick perspective, you don't see the wicks on these candles anymore. Uh, it's unusual, and it's just sort of a uh, a comment here. Obviously, it's not very scientific to say something like that, but you can see there seems to be kind of just less uh, magnitude of movements. Now, we can actually quantify that by using this data here. Now, on the left is the VIX 9-day uh, versus the VIX on the right, and this is the number of days we've had since a two-standard deviation move, either in the VIX 9-day or the VIX itself. Now, the VIX 9-day should move a lot more, particularly in times of fear. It should jump a lot more. Um, when there's a crisis. And many of us are familiar with this in the idea of when term structure in the S&P, for example, gets backwardated because there's so much fear, short demand, uh, uh, demand for short dated options increases and you get that those higher implied vols. In this case, we haven't seen a two standard deviation move in the VIX nine day. It's the longest period forever. We're talking 300 days plus of no major spike. And this encompasses uh, some pretty interesting times like the March of 2023 bank crisis. Uh, and it's a very similar story here in, in the VIX where, you know, this, you have to go back to 2012 for anything that looks like this. 2017 is right in the middle here. It's large, uh, one of the bigger spikes. This is very, you know, clearly odd. So back to this idea of, hey, where are the wicks on this chart? Um, well, they're, they just don't exist anymore. And this is very unusual. It's very anomalous. To this point, you know, this just measures the intraday range of the VIX in uh, the VIX nine day. And what's interesting here, and this is, you know, correlation is not causation, uh, you know, flag we have to throw here, but zero DTEs were fully launched in so the start of 2000, excuse me, the start of November, 2022. Uh, they were fully launched for the S&P 500 index options, as well as spiders and Qs. And you can see that volatility really seems to have flattened out right after those were fully launched. Now, the market made its major low in September, October of 2022. So there's that bounce. Uh, people started to get comfortable with rates not going up anymore. So there's that extra added, uh, you know, major uh, influence uh, into markets there. So again, correlation, not causation, but very interesting that that, that this is when uh, zero Ds were launched and volatility started to really uh, stop having any kind of tails. Here is zero DTE volume. Uh, in this case, if you go back to 2018 and 19, we're looking at Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. Uh, 
uh, expirations, but really you can see that zero DT volume is now 50% roughly of SPX total volume. And with that, the beta of the SPX, in other words, how much the S&P is moving relative to the VIX has really shrunk. Uh, and again, right in this late 2022 period is when you could see that, you know, that, that beta really started to shrink. I mean, arguably, it was more like the COVID crash that something changed. Um, but you know, you can see there is, again, this this correlation that seems to exist. Now, moving to actually just pure S&P data, this is the longest, third longest period we've ever had. And you can add four days of this now, five days of this now, uh, without a 2% drawdown in the S&P. The only times that beat this was mid-2000 or early 2007. After that 2007 period, the market sold off about 4 or 5%, and then it rallied into June, and then that was the top. That was the uh, the onset of the financial crisis. The second data point is Volmageddon. So that's when this period uh, ends. It breaks with Volmageddon. So that's the feedback loop from the 2017 period that kept very low volatility. It ended with Volmageddon. A couple of other interesting data points here. 2018, we had a very, very nasty crash into the end of 2018, which was the uh, Mnuchin called the banks on Christmas Eve. And at that options expiration, that's when the market rallied. So a very ugly period that broke there. Um, and then lastly is... This incredible data point here, really into options expiration again in February of 2020, that broke the COVID crash and one of the most violent drawdowns in market history occurred uh, immediately after this very calm period in time. So there's something about this period of calm or extended period of calm that tends to end violently. And we're again in that kind of peak of those periods. Also interesting is days without a 2% move. It's extremely strange to me to have this record common markets in terms of drawdowns, but also record comms in terms of move up. Uh, the fact that we don't have a 2% move up or down, we're now the fourth largest period or just had the fourth largest period. I would note that on this day is when the NVIDIA earnings came out and they were really good and the market rallied. Since then, we've had a month and a half of no more 2% moves. So so other than that one little blip, uh, you know, the, the period is really extended. It is really very odd, uh, you know, in our lens. So um, unusual calm, right? Uh, writ large, volatility is just, it, it's dead as the, as the slide uh, denotes. I, I wanted to lay out a couple of uh, distributions here just to give an idea of, of, of how prices move. Um, 2019 forward is really the period of, of the modern options environment. That's where options volume really started to pick up. That's why I started in 2019. And you could see that you know, generally speaking, there's way less tails, and that would sync with what we just said. Whether it's the close to close return, the open to close return, or the intraday range, uh, in green here, we we just don't get tails anymore. The distribution is very tight now, uh, very near to unchanged. And again, you know, this is anomalous in that we don't get these tails uh, to the upside or downside anymore. If you compare this to 2021, uh, which is in purple there. 2021 was a very bullish environment, obviously. That's why I, I compare it to here. Also, a lot of options activity. Um, and, you know, the the curves, again, are lacking the tail. Particularly, though, you know, we should note the right tail is really missing from the S&P 500 here in this 2024 period. We would have these days in 2021 where we had these big ramps in price where we gained 2 or 3%. Not in, not in 2024 to this point. This ties into correlation and some of the things that we're about to talk about uh, here. Of these charts, let's just look at the standard deviation of returns. The intraday range is what's most interesting to me. 2017 had tighter ranges, uh, as, as you can see, on a standard deviation basis. But other than that, you know, these two years, 2017 and this year, uh, are real standouts in terms of how quiet they have been. So let's turn to dispersion. Dispersion measures, and this is the SIBO dispersion uh, index. It measures how much the individual components of the S&P 500 are moving relative uh, to each other. High dispersion means you're getting a lot of individual stocks that are making big moves. So semi-stocks, financials, energies are starting to move. You know, those are moving a lot more than the other components of the indices. Um, it's unusual this year. We have we would have dispersion in previous years where certain stocks would crash a lot more than others. Um, obviously, in 2020, in the COVID crash, you had dispersion because things like cruise lines may go out of business, right? Go out of existence, whereas maybe hospitals would fare a little bit better. Yes, all stocks went down, so there's a high correlation to movement, but individual components were moving a lot more. To this point on correlation, this is the SIBO one-month correlation index. What this is telling us is that, you know, not all components in the S&P 500 are moving in the same direction. So the S&P itself is generally going up, 
semis are going crazy, consumer staples, maybe not so good, right? And that correlation is unusual, uh, is unusually low. It can kind of peak into times of earnings, but really what you're seeing here is correlation lows that go back to 2017. Uh, correlation snaps towards one when we have markets crash, right? Like again, in 2020, all stocks sell off, correlation spikes. Uh, correlation very low here. Again, that's breadth is weak that ties in that idea, uh, as well as certain stocks are moving asymmetrically to the upside. Now let's look at the SIBO three-month correlation, same as the one month. Just interesting here is that this is now uh, well below anything that we've seen in recent past. So if you look at the options, out, uh, prices out three months in time, um, you can see that people think there's going to be a lot more movement um, up in certain sectors uh, or certain stocks versus the index as a whole. You can look at uh, the implied correlation. This is from Goldman, just drives home this point that correlation is indeed uh, very low. This is their own individual metrics. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we're going to flip to skew. What this is measuring is the, the value of one month calls versus one month puts. And what's interesting about this is that the calls have a higher relative value to puts than they've had at any point since really the internet bubble back in 2020. Um, excuse me, 2000. Uh, it's very unusual to have S&P calls have that bid uh, or high implied vol relative to puts in such a fashion. Uh, it's anomalous. It's something that happened obviously off the dip in 2022. It makes sense because people are trying to buy the dip. Uh, buying calls is a way, an effective way to get that upside exposure. It's a little curious now that markets have rallied to all-time highs that that bid persists. There's just this demand uh, for upside calls and also supply of puts. People also in this environment, I think it's safe to say, do not believe that the market is going to go down, right? Uh, it's a real theme of these markets. And put selling was something we saw a lot of in 2022. To this point, the SDEX, which measures a one standard deviation, the value of a one standard deviation spider put, that's one month out in time. Uh, so there's no kind of call measurement here. This is purely put positioning. It's at all time lows. Um, and so people here are not looking to get long that protection or the value of that protection is very low. Um, doesn't mean it's cheap, right? Cheap is a, is a different term. In this case, what we're just seeing is that uh, the demand for those for those one month, one standard deviation options, very low. VIX is the VIX of the VIX. If there was demand for out of the money VIX calls, like some say there are, you would see, you would think the VIX really, VIX, excuse me, really spike up as demand for out of the money calls increases. Um, doesn't seem to be happening in this environment. This suggests kind of like the SDEX that there is not real big demand for tail hedges. Now, what's interesting about this is that the vol suppression is not just in the U.S. markets. You can see it really across the globe here. And this is from the S&P uh, Global. Uh, volatility, very low. Correlation, very low. Dispersion uh, uh, readings that you can see here, you know, they're lower in, in some of the other markets than we're getting maybe in the S&P 500. But, you know, there's a real uniformity to these measures uh, across the globe. And really, if you look at cross asset, this is from the CBO, this just came out. Uh, gold vol is spiking a little bit recently, but oil rates, uh, credit vol is very low. So this is a this low vol really is a function in our view of just the you know monetary and fiscal policies that we have. In that you know there's the kind of just let's just call it the Fed put seems to be in place. Rates aren't going up right now. We're arguing about how many rate cuts we may get. People are very sort of I think confident in. Uh, the path of of that, or or more certain, I should say, uh, in the path of things happening over the next, let's call it months, and that has global volatility across assets seems to be very low. So there's that there's something that's tying everything together, and obviously uh, one would point to rates as that as that link. So let's talk again quickly about VIX volumes. You can see back in volume again, you know, there was huge VIX call volumes as that uh, those VIX ETPs unwound, the short vol ETPs unwound, and those volumes are higher than we have today. But there is indeed a relatively kind of local high in volumes. If I fast forward to just 20, 2022 and beyond, again, the intraday VIX highs way back here uh, in, in mid-January of 2022, and VIX volumes are spiking here. Now, if VIX volumes are spiking. Why are we not getting the response in the VIX? You would think that if this is predominantly long call positions, that the VIX would have to move a lot more as dealers uh, would have to kind of hedge themselves. It's just not happening. Um, and if you look at open interest, which is shown here, it is record VIX call open interest relative to 2017. 
Uh, but the VIX, as we showed early in the presentation, the VIX isn't getting these big standard deviation jumps. And again, we had a big risk event with the March COVID crash, but we didn't get the big relative pop in the VIX. Uh, it just doesn't seem to be happening. So very curious environment here. The fact that we're not getting these responses in volatility, despite the big open interest, suggests to me that there is a lot of short VIX positioning that's out there or short volatility positioning um, that is alleviating dealers of some hedging uh, responsibilities. Here we just zoom in on the VIX call open interest over a shorter time frame. And again, you know, VIX calls are indeed high. So if we look at S&P SKUs, which stand out to you here, this is from that mid-January 2022 period where we had very high VIX. You can see that the volatility is writ large is higher, right? So, you know, the at the monies, if you look at the 50 deltas, roughly 20% implied vol. But you can see the slope here, uh, out of the money calls, the 25 delta calls have a lower implied vol than the, the equivalent put. Same thing in 2017, which is the orange, or green line, excuse me, there's a much lower relative value of implied volatility, but the calls hold a relative lower value than the equivalent put. Not really so in the current environment, which is white. Uh, vol is kind of in the middle of these two, obviously, but the call seems to have a relatively higher applied vol than the put. It's unusual in that if all of these overriding flows are supplying slightly out of the money one month calls, then you would expect to see that that skew would not be tilted in the fashion it is. This speaks to there being one of two things. One is call demand, uh, which we believe is the case, but also put selling. And that has the skew flatter than what we have seen at these other kind of anomalous times out in history. Um, and this data, we should say, is from Bloomberg. So can we blame zero DTs and options ETFs? Let's dig into the data. Uh, we ran this poll on our Twitter feed just out of curiosity. We read a Wall Street Journal article that suggested that a lot of the reasons that people would pile into these call overriding funds like JEPI, which is the JP Morgan, S&P overriding or QYLD, um, that it was for protection against drawdowns. We never really thought of it. I mean, obviously some people pitched that as a reason, but we really framed it as yields and dividends. And that is what indeed the, the poll results here were as well, that people are looking for yield and these things yield roughly 8%. Not so much, hey, it's going to hedge me in case the market goes down. Um, these overriding funds do indeed hedge you if the market goes down a little bit, right? It pads some of those losses, but it also caps your gains. Uh, which is a major problem of these assets. This was a headline from um, the Financial Times, which was just hilarious to us. It says, J.P. Morgan blames J.P. Morgan for suppressed volatility. And the idea here is that the J.P. Morgan analyst, like Marco Kalanovic, put out this paper that said, hey, look, giant call overriding funds are supplying a ton of gamma and a ton of vega to the street and they're suppressing volatility. This is a problem. It's going to break. Uh, or it's, I shouldn't say it's going to break. It's just a problem that it's suppressing volatility. Well, the biggest fund of call overriding is JP Morgan. 44% uh, of this call overriding, which as you can see, has increased greatly in time, is a lot of put overriding. Uh, there are indeed some other positions out there like put spread collars or collars, which is like the JP Morgan collar fund, which sells a call to buy a put. Uh, there's big assets in those types of strategies as well. But all of these are options links ETFs. And the idea here is that they are having an outsized impact to markets. Uh, this from uh, Sokjin, or Namir, I believe, excuse me, tells us that about $100 billion in, in these derivatives-based funds. And on the right here is from Morningstar. And what it shows you is that the put-right fund, which is just writing a put, has outperformed the market because the that short volatility trade is also a beneficiary of the market going up. It's performed just really well over the course of the last few years, but the market only goes up. Uh, and red is just the S&P 500, and then blue, we have the call overriding funds. So the point of the call overriding funds or call overriding generally not working as well from a total return, uh, you know, very apparent here. That's just kind of a footnote onto what we are on about uh, in this presentation. Here we have uh, gamma from dealers. Mm. As you can see here, the implication from JP Morgan is that the supply of long gamma has increased sharply over the last couple of years. And if you look at the profile of that, you see right around the at the money, there's a ton of gamma. And if you drift just sort of 5% down or up, that gamma profile shrinks dramatically. Now, the idea here is that the more positive gain we have in the market, those hedging flows serve to suppress volatility in that there's a ton of stock for dealers to sell as the market goes up, a ton of stock to buy as the market comes down, and that puts volatility in a straitjacket. So this makes sense when you line up how little or how low volatility is in a lot of the charts that we just uh, presented. They also suggest here that you can link this big supply of options-based gamma 
to when the VIX just started to tank. Now we denote that right at the same time that this kind of correlation seems to shift, zero DTE options were launched. Now, again, correlation causation, there's some interpretation you want to launch here, but all of these things seem to really line up. This is the supply of Vega. So as options are being sold, uh, these calls are being sold, it does supply Vega, which is how changes of implied volatility are hedged uh, to dealers. So, you know, long gamma, long Vega, the hedging flows, those combined hedging flows would both in theory serve to suppress volatility. The market is just not going to move as much, whether vol spikes or whether uh, the underlying S&P price moves. There, is these, there are these flows that just kind of snuff those moves out. Um, and again, this corresponds with that data that we've just outlined of how the VIX isn't moving and the S&P isn't moving. Now, the Bank of International Sentiments did a paper as well. Uh, we'll post all this on our site, spotgamma.com, where they basically say, look, it's not zero DTE suppressing vol. Uh, they don't go into how vol is being suppressed in the depth we did. They just sort of look at the VIX. And in this case, they say, look, huge spike in call ETFs. That's the reason vol is getting crushed, not zero DTE. We're not convinced of that. Uh, we'll talk about that shortly, but this is what the uh, academics at the BIS wrote. So let's talk about the mechanics of these flows, just outline exactly how these are possibly suppressing volatility. Uh, on the top here, if you have a big positive gamma position, which is what we believe dealers do, and that's what uh, JP Morgan and other banks have suggested, that means that when the stock is going up and the index is going up, you're selling stock into that rally and you're buying stock as the market goes down and that decreases volatility, right? The more stock I have to sell, it stops the market from going up. The more I have to buy, it stops it from going down, it straight jackets volatility. The opposite position would be if everyone was buying puts or buying VIX calls and that puts dealers in a negative gamma position as the market starts to crash, they're selling stock as the market goes down and they're buying as the market goes up and volatility expands. Here's our gamma curve. You can get a you can get this curve. This is a naive curve, meaning we assume all calls are being sold to dealers and all puts are being bought. If you go to our spot gamma free resources, you can get this. But we see peak gamma around 530 in the S and P. Excuse me, 5300 in the S and P, and a negative gamma position initiates around 5200. So we're testing that level as we speak today. Under that level is this negative gamma position where we see volatility really increase. Now, if you wanted to quantify where the gamma risks in terms of expiration and strike, you would expect based on the way that these overriding funds work that most gamma is supplied in the next 30 days on a rolling basis. And you can see that is indeed the case here when you look at uh, the chart in that, yes, the next 30 days is where all the major gamma pieces are. A lot of zero GT positions are constantly coming in short dated one, two, three uh, days to expiration. Uh, if you look at gamma by strike, it is indeed relative to that JP Morgan uh, uh, chart concentrated around the at the money. And again, if you just move a couple percent to the left or right here, the gamma supply shrinks dramatically. And so the question is, you know, when the market gets out of these positions or these into these wings, does volatility start to increase? We think it does. Um, and to quantify that, we have this chart. Now, what we do here is we have our gamma index, uh, which measures the gamma from close of day yesterday, and then we forecast, we put this out about seven in the morning, we forecast how much movement the market should have. Now, in this case, what you can see is that when we have a big positive gamma environment like we uh, had over the last couple of weeks, you can see that market S&P returns over the next day are pretty tight. And the more negative gamma gets as we get to the left of this chart, the more volatility expands. The orange dots are just from the last year. So you can see that we're falling in line with where we've been historically, but what's interesting in this case is that the tails are gone. So when, even though when we get into a negative gamma environment, we don't get the two, three, four percent moves in the market that we used to get when we had this big negative gamma position. Um, so the gamma to us is not anomalous in terms of how large it is. It seems to be more in line with what we've seen over recent years. Uh, but the response to the market in the negative gamma regime where we expect big volatility, we don't get big volatility responses. They just don't occur anymore. Uh, it's very odd. So what does this mean if we think about a paradigm for how the market works? Well, we have this big gamma, positive gamma market, which either reduces or expands uh, volatility. So currently, these big positive gamma positions reduce volatility. That means that realized vol shrinks because the market doesn't move as much as it used to. And then traders say, okay, the market is only moving at a 10% realized volatility. So we can sell implied volatility or forward volatility, or we can adjust our expectations and say, hey, uh, 
let's sell this vault, it's too expensive. And that allows more gamma to concentrate around at the money positions and it's a feedback loop. And these feedback loops generally snap with an options expiration or when something anomalous happens that no one expects, uh, like a Fed change in policy, geopolitical uh, issues, et cetera. Now, to this point around volatility shrinking and gamma increasing, you can see here that this is a high volatility estimate, right? And when volatility shrinks and comes down, gamma increases around the at the money strikes. And so those positions, like the charts we were showing, gamma increases there. That means that locally there's more to suppress volatility. The wings are more uh, susceptible to lower gamma and less hedging there, but the at the money has more. And, and, and the gamma environment, excuse me, the volatility environment has been coming down sharply over the last several years, obviously. And so, you know, this helps to kind of localize that gamma. This affects, as I mentioned, implied volatility. So that's the Vanna trade. And essentially, if you assume that we have a big long call dealer position, short put position, that means that when vol goes up, they can sell into it. And when vol comes down, they can buy stock back. This is the Vanna component of the, of the trade. Um, that helps to further suppress volatility. Um, this gives you an idea of how Delta adjusts with implied volatility. What you can basically see is that as vol comes down, uh, the wings lose value, right? So you can see the out of the money calls start to come down uh, as well as the puts. So that the implied vol, excuse me, the Delta adjusts as implied vol comes down. So, so you know, there are these knock on effects. There's a lot of charts that I talk about skew and unusual options prices, et cetera. And these are all affected by the big change in implied vol that we've seen, but we also want to make a nod to the change in interest rates. Uh, higher interest rates push the call values up. What do I mean by that? It means that if you measure where a 25 delta is relative to interest rates, the higher rates go, the higher the strike you have to go to sell a 20 or 25 delta put. This matters for these options funds, a lot of which are selling a, roughly a 20 delta put. They're selling at higher strikes. Uh, whereas on the put side of things, uh, as you raise rate, the delta of those puts uh, shifts down, right? It, it, it changes the dynamics um, of how uh, of how options are priced, which is critical to when you look at some of these skew charts and the like. Uh, this is a little bit of a, a of a higher order concept. We just want to make a nod to it that when you're doing this analyst analysis, you do have to sort of think about some of the knock on effects of these uh, high rate environments that we've had. So, what are the impact of zero DT options? Uh, zero DT options, as we mentioned before, launched fully in late, uh, early uh, November 2022. Mark has done very well since then. And it's hard to eyeball a real change in volatility. I mean, 2022 was so violent. You know, when you look at this chart, certainly the 2022-23 period looks fairly normal. You know, there's very, very, very little movement in 2024, as we've already outlined. So what does the volume look like here? Um, this is the percentage of volume that is zero DTE. And you can see we're up around 50%. Um, and the comparison of all volume is here on the top. You know, really the increase in S&P volumes are is all tied to zero DTEs at this point. It's a dominant uh, piece of market flows on a daily basis. <clears throat> now, when you look across who is trading zero DTEs, you can see there's a indeed a real balance between customer flow, which is almost one to one according to data from the SIBO. Market making flow is almost one to one. Firm flow is almost one to one. Pro customer volumes. So it's like they basically are telling us that everything pairs off perfectly. Uh, it's somewhat unbelievable to to note that you know for every customer contract bought, there's essentially a customer contract sold. You would think that it would be paired off more against other entity types, but this is what the data is telling us. So what we did here is we normalized the market maker put flow by puts bought, which is in blue, and uh, and sold, which is there. Uh, excuse me, sold, which is in blue, bought, which is in red, and we normalized it by how far out of the money that position is over the course of the day. And what you distinctly kind of see here is that there's something like a condor or a, or a fly where the body's short but the wings are long. And what that basically means is that if there is indeed a big jump in the market up or down the dealer or market makers seem to be hedged uh, with these positions. Uh, you can see that the biggest strike here is the 1% down and 1% up, obviously. Um, and, and there seems to be some hedging, which is connotated in this red. Um, if you look at the customer side of the put flow, they tend to be, interestingly, buyers of these puts, sellers of slightly out of the money puts on a daily basis, uh, which is interesting to measure the flow in this way. So it seems to be there's a little bit more of a long uh, long position from the customer side. 
Uh, this is the same thing with the call flow. Indeed, it looks like generally calls are being sold from the at the money to the up uh, by the dealer community. And if the market is not moving very much, uh, then this should be a fairly profitable trade for market makers on, on, a, on a rough average basis. Uh, indeed, here we see that customers tend to get long kind of the at the money calls, maybe short a 1% of the money call as the day kind of goes on. Uh, but they're, again, the takeaway here is it seems like the customer positioning uh, generally seems to be net long on the calls and puts and dealers are net short, which if you have extremely suppressed volatility on a daily basis, that's a very profitable trade, you would think, uh, for the market making community. And also that makes sense. I mean, uh, if there is something going on in the market making space that's making them lose money on a daily basis, you would think they would make pretty rapid adjustments uh, to stop losing money, right? They charge more for the options or adjust their behavior, whatever it may be. So those are our real takeaways here. Um, that the, the ways that you would see the, the, the winners of the zero DT flow based on how much the market is moving, what the positioning is, appear to be the market makers. And I think most of us listening to this would say, well, that makes sense, right? Uh, if they're losing money every day, they're going to go out of business. And I think, you know, if you <laughs> read the news these days and uh, what's going on, they're, they're probably not the ones on the short end of the stick. So what does that mean for what's happening going forward? A lot of people want to compare this period to 2017 based on volatility. Uh, and the big thing back in 2017 was the size of the inverse volatilities. They were $2 billion, uh, in AUM. And obviously, there was a lot of short volatility positioning happening. Now, this is a chart from back in the day in, in, uh, from Goldman. We grabbed this from, I believe, a 2017 article. Uh, excuse me, 2018 article. And, you know, what you can see here is that they had all this vega to buy in 2017. And so what's so interesting about this is that when vol spiked enough, those VIX ETNs went out of business essentially, right? And that caused a short volatility cover trade to have to occur. There had to be this vol being bought when those assets blew up. Now, in this case, there is no equivalent, at least in the call overriding space, forced cover trade that would have to take place. If the stock market crashes, those calls go to zero right? The, the value of those essentially go to zero. Now, they'll continue to maybe sell calls. In theory, if all of a sudden there was a massive sell in those assets and the market didn't sell down, but everyone sold their underlying stocks, and, and then there was this big call a purchase that had to get made, then in theory, that could maybe move the market up. But then dealers, or excuse me, the, 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 the fund would at the same time have to liquidate the shares of stock they own. And it you just don't see the same force cover trade in the um, in this overriding complex. Um, and it, a lot of it is cash settled as well. So if the stock market goes up, you get a little bit of a cash settled uh, position that has to take place, but those gains are offset. But the, excuse me, the losses in the call overriding is offset by gains in the stock portfolio itself. So there's an underperformance issue here, not really kind of a margin call. Now you can make the argument that in the zero DTE space, if you have a crash uh, and, and you know market makers had to scramble for cover, but based on the data we showed just a minute ago, you know, they seem to be pretty well hedged. So the situation could be in the zero DT space that could create a forced cover, forced buy of calls or forced buying uh, of puts that force, again, that cover trade. But in theory, those zero DTs would have a one day impact maybe. Um, if market makers are shoved out of business because of some such violent trade and someone fat fingered something, then maybe there would be a multi-day market effect. But if you look at like when Knight Capital went out of business, there was no apparent knock-on effect of that, right? Uh, the markets bailed them out or whatever it may be, and, and we moved along. So it's hard to see that forced cover trade taking place. Um, one of the interesting things that has obviously happened now, and, and we talked about the global sort of cross-asset volatility that's been quelled, there's a huge correlation here between bonds, positive correlation between bonds and stock now, right? And so you have short... Uh, a real short volatility position going on in market markets, which is what that call selling is. Um, and historically, people would hedge equity positions with bonds. And now that trade broke down in 2022, and the correlation remains very high. And so much of what equity performance is based on now is the stability of rates. Okay, rates are at 5%. We don't expect them going up. We're expecting some cuts. And, you know, broadly speaking, you know, the market is ripped and rates have not shifted really uh, over the last couple of months, and the market's been fine with that. Um, the question now is, well, if the market does start to go down, can you buy bonds as a hedge? And we would think that if one of the reasons that the market 
goes down now is because rates will go up. They're not anticipated to go up. Uh, but if they did, we would assume that stocks would also go down, right? And so, you know, how do you hedge downside in your portfolio? Um, you'd really have to be kind of long volatility. And while this chart really wades into the macro, it's really the macro that has to determine kind of what happens to markets in the next pace. Now, given a macro shift that the market doesn't like or a geopolitical shift that the market doesn't like, there's a whole bunch of knock-on effects that would occur in the equity space that we can highlight, which all suggest that there should be or could be at some point a really rather violent equity market move in very large VIX spike, as a lot of the flows that we've been highlighting would have to be unwound. So to give an idea of the environment that we're looking in, uh, this is data from the S&P Global. And at the top here is measures of dispersion and then volatility. You can think of volatility essentially being the VIX in the S&P uh, on the left and mid caps on the right. And what you see is that we have a very high level of dispersion as we talked about earlier, uh, but volatility is fairly low. And there's a little bit of a vol up. So it's market up, vol up scenario. Now, back in 2020, during the COVID crash, dispersion went up, but VIX went up and volatility went up, right? Because the market was crashing, as I mentioned before, and different components of the market would move down more than other components. So what if you look through the S&P Global Research, what they show you is this period of 2020, which was the internet bubble, where dispersion spiked, but volatility really didn't. And that dispersion was because you had pets.com and all the internet stocks going crazy, but vol didn't really increase. And so if you read the comments from the S&P Global, we did a full post on this on our website, they basically say that, you know, this is deeply idiosyncratic behavior around the tech bubble, uh, deeply idiosyncratic behavior of the technology sector. Index volatility did not rise as other sectors uh, did, you know, it was essentially only technology. Uh, so the other sectors perform more normally. And so dispersion can better capture periods where only a portion of the market is either bubbling or crashing. And you get that feeling now where there are these flows like the gamma flows in markets, which is suppressing S&P volatility, but you have this long volatility position in things like the semis. You have two 3X levered NVIDIA ETFs. You have all of these crypto positions that are all leading to these idiosyncratic moves in certain stocks where there is clearly significant outperformance. That's the dispersion, but the index flows are being suppressed by things like call overriding and zero DTE positions. So volatility is sort of at a high level when you just look at the VIX and just look at, look at volatility, it's doing something that's fairly normal, but the wings have been taken out uh, of the equation by these flows. And what that does is it draws more reflexive flows that keep betting that these wings aren't going to occur. So there's not a real bid to long dated volatility, anything out past a couple of days. Uh, you know, put buying is you know, you, you don't want all the puts anymore. You got to get long certain stocks because that's what's outperforming. Uh, and that reflexive behavior just continues uh, to, to, to culminate in this feedback loop that at some point gets snapped. Now, what could cause these snaps? You know, inflation is the obvious one. We leave that to the macro set to determine what has to take place there. You have the geopolitical tensions, which only seem to be escalating. The market's been digesting those pretty well. And then credit. Credit is always an issue because when you have issues in the credit market, oftentimes if you think a certain stock's you know, going to default, you want to buy equity puts uh, to possibly hedge your credit exposure. So that can drive a lot of put demand. Um, what that would all lead, some triggers going to lead to is you're going to have correlation jump. So correlation is going to go from very quiet to high as all stocks get sold. Um, you would also have a situation where index vol would respond by moving up. So not only do you have to have index vol move up in this situation, but there's a big short volatility trade, I believe, with traders selling longer dated puts or possibly even selling uh, volatility upside. They have to cover that trade and then they would have to go long. The other issue here is that if you have an unknown, uh, like if you know banks are defaulting, but you don't know exactly when and where, then you need to own longer dated options to hedge those positions. You need to own letter longer dated puts to hedge credit issues. You need to own longer dated puts if you need to hedge the prospect of a significant geopolitical es uh, escalation, right? You can hedge out the FOMC by a zero DT option or a certain single data print with the zero DT option, but you can't hedge out unknown timing um, with a zero DTE. And so that forces people into longer dated options that lifts volatility up in a way um, that forces flows that are negative gamma, short vega positions that cause to a lot of unwinds. Now, 
in doing this research, I came back to a lot of Chris Cole's work, fantastic, you know, incredible work. Um, and he talks about the alchemy of risk. And I had remembered reading these papers a few years ago and, and reading a lot of what he wrote and how he actually projected, interestingly, a lot of the feedback loops and how they would uh, possibly even spiral up into an environment that we have now, which is really so fascinating. And he calls it the, you know, the great snake and uh, Ouroboros of risk. And essentially what you note here in the quote is that volatility itself is stabilizing. There's these reflexive flows that are stabilizing the market and they're being counted on uh, as a source of stability and zero TTEs feed on that and short, uh, you know, selling uh, short dated options feeds on that uh, short volatility positions. All that is a feedback loop. And then also as well, getting long 2x NVIDIA positions as well, right? Those are very prevalent now, those types of positions and getting long, you know, uh, semi stocks because they can only go up. Now, at some point when that feedback loop snaps, it has to travel back from a short cover trade just to get back to an equilibrium, and then it shifts into a long, uh, a longer position. So that's the risk that we face uh, in this current market, that all of these flows start to unwind. And if you move just 2 or 3% down, you lose that big positive gamma position. Uh, the zero DTEs aren't an effective cover trade. That, those flows that are suppressing the intraday tails aren't an effective cover trade if long volatility positions start to pick up in the market. And I think that can lead to a big jump in volatility. Now, I wouldn't anticipate that happening before this year's election, just as a generalization. Uh, but we need to be aware that if we start to move lower in markets, particularly if we start to have a down 1% or 2% day, that could really ignite some of these other flows that would have to unwind. So with that, uh, we will wrap it up. We hope that this presentation was helpful and interesting. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section. Send us a note at info at spotgamma.com. You can reach out to us on Twitter at spotgamma, and we look forward to hearing from you soon.